Have you ever wondered if animals can feel complex emotions like us? How would we relate to them if we knew they are capable of experiencing pleasure, pain, joy and fear? Do you think your relationship with them would change if we told you they can? In this episode, we look into the impact of biodiversity and habitat loss on animals and people as a result of climate change. We'll explore why hundreds of Amazon River dolphins are dying from rising temperatures and droughts. We'll also understand more about how animals are suffering in Brazil due to intense agribusiness. And we'll speak to a wildlife documentary maker who's seen the impact climate change is having on wildlife firsthand. I'm Johnny Bunyan. And from World Animal Protection, this is Animals Are Calling. Habitat loss is the greatest threat to the world's biodiversity and wild animals are experiencing a catastrophic decline in their natural habitats through human activity and climate change. Trillions of animals are exploited in the lucrative global wildlife trade every year, while agriculture is the single largest cause of habitat loss as it ruthlessly clears land to grow crops to feed farmed animals. And it's sentient animals caught in the crossfire beings who think, feel, have personalities and needs that are suffering routinely at human hands. I want to understand more about how the changes in our planet are having a direct effect on the animal kingdom. So I set up a call with Dr. Roberto Vieto. He's a veterinarian and works as a global animal welfare advisor for World Animal Protection. He's been a witness of Brazil fires firsthand and has been there in the Pantanal and other areas seeing how wild animals are victims of these fires. He joined me down the line from Costa Rica in the Pacific coast and I began by asking him what does he think the impact of climate change and habitat loss has had on the sentient wild animals? Sure, well I think that we all have witnessed <laughs> the impact of climate change especially in 2023. Uh, we have seen like really extreme weather events uh, droughts, floods, you can see the Amazon getting so dry and, and we as humans can leave or experiment what, what those changes uh, or that uh, the impact that climate change is having in our daily lives and it's the same for animals. Uh, animals are enduring extreme conditions, they are losing their homes because of these massive wildfires, uh, it's difficult to find food for them um, and just to put it like more in, in, into context, uh, for example, when the, a wildfire happens, uh, animals try to escape. Some animals are not uh, um, fast enough to escape from those wildfires, so they can get burned. And, you know, it's, it's that direct impact that the, the climate change is having on, on wild animals is causing a lot of suffering and is a big threat for their conservation. Apart from habitat loss, apart from the food scarcity, you can uh, think also of the change in pattern in diseases. Uh, hot weather increases the prevalence of, of some vectors of diseases, of some mosquitoes. So also the dynamics in terms of, of diseases can change. And um, in general terms, uh, basically animals are losing their homes to like floods, droughts, uh, obligates them to move to new areas and and that causes a, a major stress in them. Let's talk a bit about that and particularly Brazil. Um, knowing that, that those animals experience complex emotions, that complex emotions is something we've been talking throughout the series and understanding the complex emotions and the sentience that they have. How do you think those animals in particular are responding to the catastrophic loss of habitat in Brazil? Some animals can adapt better to different changes like uh, to different environmental scenarios, uh, some animals don't. Uh, for example, uh, animals that can move faster can uh, um, escape from fires. Animals that live in in burrows, they normally get. When, for, for example, in the case of a wildfire, animals that live in burrows are the first that have uh, this mortality. Uh, um, so it depends on the type of species. Uh, in general, it's, it's difficult for them because they have to endure uh, scenarios where 
even the cycle of the plants change. So the type of food that they can access or the time of the year when they were accessing determinate food is changing. Um, the best way that they can adapt is to move to another area, but sometimes they are moving to areas where there are human settlements and this causes also a major risk for them because we're talking about animals displacing from their natural habitat where they know everything and they have the food to areas where they will have to cross highways and they are a uh, subject to road killings or car accidents. They are going closer to uh, um, urban areas where you have all these electric um, cables and they are subject of electrocutions. Uh, they also get closer to homes where they keep pets and that can sparkle a negative interaction, for example, with dogs or cats and wildlife. So you have these attacks of, of, of dogs to the specific animal. And animals are super scared because the noise, the light, and everything looks very unnatural for them. But that's the, that's the area there where they are escaping. If, if the natural habitat is scaring drowned uh, or is affected by fires, they are getting closer or, or getting isolated in areas that are still available for them to find food and, and find some refuge, or they are getting closer to human settlements where they experience all these kind of stressful situations and are under a big threat of getting killed, attacked, or even people getting scared of the presence of those animals and taking measures to, uh, you know, uh, kill them or get them out of their houses. So it's it's a big issue in terms of how uh, animals can, you know, cope with climate change. Factory farming is a climate culprit that can no longer be ignored. Agribusiness defines agriculture that's been conducted strictly for commercial principles. I'm interested to understand how agribusiness and factory farming is playing a part in the harming of both wild and farmed animals. And I asked Dr. Roberto to explain more. When we're talking about agribusiness, they have a very important role in terms of climate change because, for example, when you talk about factory farming, which is this industrial large scale of producing meat, uh, we cannot forget about all the sources that are needed to keep an operation like that functioning. And also, uh, um, you have to think of the full change because when we talk about factory farming, how these animals are going to be fed. So this is coming from areas where um, wild animals live also. So the problem is that to produce enough food to, to feed those animals, you need vast extensions of lands to produce monocultures. Roberto's work in this space is echoed by another wildlife crusader in the form of Dr. Miriam Marmontel. Miriam is a Brazilian oceanographer who specialises in aquatic mammals, particularly the Amazonian manatee. She's been working in this space for over 40 years and is now a senior researcher and leader of the Amazon Aquatic Mammal Research Group at the Mamarua Institute for Sustainable Development. She and her team recently had to respond to an unprecedented emergency, finding many dead dolphins in the rivers in the heart of the Amazon, a tragedy she believes is a direct result of climate change. She joined me down the line from Tefe in the Amazon to share the latest of what effects climate change was having on the wildlife that she spent years studying. We've been experiencing an unprecedented event of mortality of river dolphins, not only Amazon river dolphins, but also Tukushi, so they're Amazonian river dolphins. The pink one, that's original name is Amazon river dolphin and the tukushi, which is a dolphinid more similar to the bottlenose dolphin. Since mid or late September, we've detected a high mortality of these animals. We had, um, we recorded 19 carcasses in, in one day. And then five day la days later, we recorded 70 carcasses and a few in between. Um, then slowly that disappeared. And then we, we identified that the same thing was happening in Kwari, which is a town 200 kilometers downriver from Tefe, uh, another lake very similar to Lake Tefe, and also having uh, mortality of dolphins. Could you describe 
uh, Amazon River Dolphins to us and just explain a bit more about them and how sentient they are, if you can explain a bit about their sentience. Yes, we have two uh, species in the Amazon. The Amazon Amazon River Dolphin, which is also uh, known as the Pink Dolphin, and that's a very um, primitive um, animal from a primitive family, extremely adapted to the Amazon uh, region. It, it's a very bulky animal, very large, um, robust. Uh, it's got some uh, very wide um, um, pectoral fins, a very l- low dorsal fin, uh, because it doesn't really have to have speed um, in the calm waters of the Amazon. It doesn't have a very good vision because most of the waters are murky. And it has a very high flexibility. It can really turn around its neck, almost turn around, touch its tail. And that's so that it can go into the flooded forest and explore and uh, catch fishes within the flooded forest. Because here in the Amazon, we have this uh, cycle every year of floods and droughts where we have a difference in, in water level up to 11 meters. The other species is the tukushi, and that's more more akin a marine dolphin, very similar to torsiops or, or the bottlenose dolphin, just kind of a smaller version of it, very much like what you, you would think of a, a dolphin, you know, a, a high dorsal fin, uh, really more built for speed, so not as well as uh, adapted to the forest. But both of them are all very ad- adapted to the, the this rise and in, in, in low of water every year. So they, they've ad- adapted basically to the rise of the water. What they're not adapted to is the, the drought, very extreme droughts, because then, you know, everything gets concentrated, shortened, uh, warm, and, uh, and that's when the, the dolphins start having problems. I could tell from Miriam's face that this level of devastation was on a scale that she'd not seen before. I wanted to know how certain she was that these deaths were as a result of climate change. We, we still haven't had the final decision or final results to say, you know, what the cause was of the high mortality. But we, I'm sure it's very, very much linked to climate change and the high uh, temperatures that we experienced this year. Uh, at the day when most of the animals died, we had uh, 40 degrees centigrade in the water. There was heavy uh, smoke around from fires around the, the area. Humidity was very low. We had usually have 90 percent, and that de- uh, in those days we had 50 percent. And air quality in general was was very bad. So I think all this combination of uh, environmental, uh, physical, and chemical um, factors have affected the animals very heavily, but mainly the shallow water and the very str- very warm temperatures. Um, there might be some other factor that we're still uh, analyzing, like a biotoxin, some contaminants, but everything that we've done um, kind of uh, doesn't point at any other factor rather th- uh, other than the heat. I, just just on that, obviously, so there's lots of different factors you mentioned, but presumably the fact that these extreme weather events are happening more regularly, that is, is the regularity and the fact that there's such a disruption, is that also presumably a factor? Yes, we've been experiencing some um, extreme droughts and floods over the years. I've been here in the Amazon for 30 years and I've seen it before, but never at this level and never so close. We can see it now every five years or so. So they're more intense and more frequent um, in the past few years. And and the predictions are that this is going to be increased over the next decades. So the the, the scenery for the the situation here in the Amazon is really not very good for dolphins, but not only dolphins, for the whole biodiversity, including men. Miriam and her team had to drop everything to respond to this emergency. I was interested to understand exactly what happened. A couple of weeks before the event, we and my uh, the, my team and I were in the Amana Sustainable Development Reserve. 
This is one of the two uh, reserves that Mamirawa Institute works in. Um, and our group works with specifically with um, aquatic mammals, river dolphins, otters, and manatees. We had just finished the campaign and we captured 20 um, Amazon River dolphins, the pink dolphin, uh, with the aim of um, adapting radio or satellite transmitters to understand their movements during the seasons and also to determine some basic parameters of health because we were concerned that eventually one of these crises that we've been seeing throughout the, 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 the world, like uh, viruses, oil spills, um, deforestation, something would eventually get to the Amazon and we wanted to be ready. Well, it was a great surprise that my team had already come back to Tefe. I was still in the reserve for three or four days, and they called me in one day saying, this is an emergency. We have been reported 18 carcasses in the lake. And it was just totally unexpected and, and shocking. So I came immediately back to the to town. And from then on, we've been in the river every single day for 12 hours a day, watching what's going on, monitoring behavior of animals in distress or animals in normal behavior, and also monitoring dead animals, carcasses that we could recover. And we set up a tent out there in the lake to necropsy every single carcasses, every single carcass that we had uh, opportunity to put our hands on do a full necropsy, collect a number of samples, maybe for fresh animals, we collected about 100 samples each to send to different specialists down south to analyze histopathology, um, potential infectious diseases, um, contaminant um, analysis, mercury, a number of different uh, studies that we tried to uh, understand, biotoxin, to see if we could uh, understand really what happened to these animals and what was causing it. We also had a team working with um, environmental monitoring that was temperature, uh, humidity, um, depth, also to make this big picture of what, what was going on. And then from what we know so far is that the main culprit is the heat uh, there might be something else associated, but basically uh, it would be the heat that caused all this mortality. And just so we understand from the, percent of, from the perspective of temperatures, what what was the, what you call normal heat temperature? And then what was the heat temperature on the day that you were down there or the day when that event occurred? Temperatures in the lake range normally between 27 and 32. That would be the the maximum. And um, we recorded 37, 39, and up to 40 degrees centigrade in the lake, especially that day when we found all the 70 carcasses. We also uh, recorded very high uh, a range of temperature, um, spanning 10 degrees a day. So that's, you know, it's uh, hard enough to have to be immersed in a 40 degree centigrade water, but also every single day getting stressed by this range of 10 degrees from 27 to 37 and then down to, towards 20s and then go, going up to the 30s. So that was must have been very stressful to the bodies of these animals. Miriam has spent her professional life studying and caring for the welfare of these species in the Amazon. And despite the increased horrors that her and her team face every day, I wanted to understand why the rest of the world should pay attention to what's happening in the Amazon and what the importance of sharing her story was trying to achieve. I think what happened to dolphins and, and humans as well in the Amazon is important to everybody, matters to everybody because it's not isolated. We are not just you know the Amazon, we are part of the world. And what's happening here is happening somewhere else as well. We have fires everywhere. We have floods in the south of Brazil. Everything is changing because of climate change and because ultimately because of us, because we are causing the, these changes. So I think it's important that we all be aware of it. Um, 
be on alert and try to step back and and change our behavior and, and our attitudes. It's not going to be quick, no. It's not going to be easy, fast. But if we don't change things right now, then um, there's not going to be any future for animals or for us. And on that, finally, what do you think that people listening to this can do? I mean, obviously they will be hopefully inspired to do something, but what can they do to help? Follow some instructions like the scientists and, and meteorologists and people that study these events have mentioned. You know, we have to reduce our, our um, fingerprint on the planet. We have to try to reduce use of fossil fuels. There's a, a number of different smaller things that we could do on on our own that but but it has to be something you know a wave throughout the, the world the whole humanity has to do that those little things and then together maybe we can we can uh, reduce these effects it's not something that one person or one community or one country could could fix it has to be something global and um, and I think there's there's several indications and several orientations that they have been given to the population is just that people don't seem I think to understand and it's to me I mean I, I never doubted climate change but seeing what happened here is just no one can deny it we, we've been feeling the, the human population has been feeling how every single year is getting hotter warmer the, the seasons but seeing what we saw at this time was just so so shocking there's no way we can deny it anymore let's turn our attention to television most of our exposure to wild animals is in the form of wildlife documentaries we can travel many thousands of miles to far-flung corners of the earth and witness the beauty and struggles of endangered species from the comfort of our own sofa I wanted to understand how much the climate crisis was influencing documentary makers, and in particular, whether something so fundamental to us all can be communicated effectively through the form of entertainment. So I travelled to Bristol in the UK to meet Johnny Hughes, a multi-award winning producer-director who works at Silverback Films, a production company who's made hit shows such as Our Planet and David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet. Studio Silverback, launched in 2020, is a new production arm of Silverback on a mission to use the power of filmmaking and storytelling to reveal the urgent truth of our changing planet to a global audience. I began by asking Johnny how tricky it is to find the line between informing the audience of the impacts of climate change and keeping the programme entertaining. I mean, the narrative is changing um, over the years and it's because we're learning more, really. Um, we are in the business of entertainment, as you say, um, but what we're very consciously doing now is bringing in this deeper story. So our planet, which we made for Netflix, for example, you know, famously did that. Um, and everything we do now, it, it's difficult not to bring in the realities of now. I mean, you can show timeless nature, if you like, in that Natural History series, and we have done that. And I think there's a real value to doing that because I think it does get people to fall in love with the natural world, which is really important. Um, but just as important as showing contemporary nature, you know, with the way nature is right now, which is that it's uh, struggling and uh, we need to be conscious of that too. So just bringing that to people's screens is informing. Uh, to your point about, is it tough? Um, I think it's getting easier actually, because um, it's more commonly understood, I think. And I also think you, you know, you have to take attack of we're not, we're not, we shouldn't be feeling guilty necessarily. Guilt is no good. I think what we should be doing is registering our responsibility and then making a change of, of course. Um, so when you're talking to a mass audience, it's really important. I mean, you, you are responsible to them in a sense, and you can't just paint a picture of doom and gloom and say it's your fault. That's no good. <laughs> We need to um, you know, bring people in and let them understand our shared problem. And also, there are loads of solutions. I mean, nature recovers magnificently when we let it. It's faster than you could imagine. And as it does so, it helps us, as I say, with the other problem we've got, which is climate change. And so on that solution focus point, do you feel that your films and the, and the, the, the programmes you've made have gone in some way to readdressing the balance in terms of 
do you think that they have a direct impact on the way people think and also the way people decide to make change in in because that's one of the important things about this series as well is that we want there to be an understanding that it's not all doom and gloom and actually each one of us even though they do something small what yeah. multiplied can make a big difference huge yeah huge and what are what are those things from your perspective oh right well um yeah i mean i think we do have an impact um in fact we've we've actually got the data to prove that. So our planet, there was a great study, a sort of before and after study, and it showed measurable difference in people's attitudes. They, not only they felt that um, they needed to do something, they also felt they could do something, <laughs> which is incredibly important. Um, they also, and, and we should you know, recognize this strongly, it's not all down to individuals at home to make the changes. You do, you ought to make changes. But also we need to demand those changes of the people that run the businesses that we buy from um, and the politicians that we elect. Um, and if you give business leaders and politicians the demand or the capacity to make change, they will. Mm. I've had politicians say to me, we need you to do your job as media people to tell the story for me to get away with the changes that we need to have. And that's true. You know, it, there needs to be an environment where everyone has a basic understanding and will for change to happen before um, it's enabled, and and so mass media has a big role to play in that. But also, that must be quite exciting for you at this point, twenty five years into doing a job you love, to feel that actually now more than ever, there's a responsibility on your shoulders to a certain extent to keep telling these stories in order to try and help. I mean, what a legacy, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's not just mine, of course. It's everyone's, and of course. And I think, you know, I think uh, I'm involved with the Earthshot Prize as well, um, mm. and you couldn't find a better embodiment of the. Um, the energy and optimism that you need to uh, broadcast and uh, you know show to the world in order to energize people, because the worst thing you can do is uh, tell such grim stories that everyone becomes defeatist or depressed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean yeah. that would that would that would stop all change in its tracks. Mm -hmm. So you know there are plenty of reasons to be cheerful, um, and it's good to point to them. At the same time, it gives you license if you do that, actually. It gives you license to talk about the realities of where we're at, mm. which is worse than most people think. This episode has shone a light on the terrifyingly detrimental effects climate change is having on our animals and their habitats. The work that Dr. Roberto and Dr. Miriam are doing is vital in us understanding more about how climate change will continue to have that impact and how the learnings of their research can help make a meaningful change. And change is happening, with Johnny's work in showing millions of people the realities of the struggle that animals face in his documentaries. The national conversation has never been more coherent in the want and need to make a difference. Next time, in our final episode of the series, we take a deep dive into the ocean and hear from a unique sea creature crusader who gives us the most amazing insight into sentience she's seen firsthand, and we hear her take on what we can all do to help. Animals Are Calling is a podcast from World Animal Protection. We're on a mission to change the way the world works, to end animal cruelty and suffering forever. My thanks to Dr. Robert Vietto, Dr. Maria Marmontel and Johnny Hughes at Silverback Films for their fascinating insight and stories. This episode was written and mixed by me, Johnny Bunyan at Pardon Our French Productions. The editorial producers are Emmy Condo and Nicola Perez. The executive producer is Georgie Bradbury. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>